Hey there, viewers. Welcome back to the fifth and hopefully final episode of the RAV4 head gasket job. Got a brand new tube of silicone, ultra gray. Pretty happy about that. And using my thinker, I got us a backup plan. I'm gonna throw this on a shelf somewhere where, well, in the event that I need it, I'll never be able to find it. But we'll know we have it. And uh, needless to say, I've got the timing cover reinstalled. Got it on the first shot, didn't wipe off any silicone. But I was this close to doing it again, believe it or not. I was so focused on the fact that I initially ran out of silicone that it just slipped my mind that the fact I took it back off was not because of, you know, uh, you know, lack of application. Well, I mean, it was, but well, anyhow, I was just so focused on the fact that I actually ran out and I was embarrassed by the fact I didn't have enough silicone to do the job that I almost forgot to do those two center parts again. <laughs> If I totally forgot and had put that on there, I would not be telling you. So I actually might have. You don't even really know. Well, no. I'm not going to lie to you. I, uh, it was close. <laughs> I mean, I wasn't like over to the car close, but it was like, uh, oh, yeah, that close. So whatever. So, um, and we did, uh, a lot of people commented on the uh, last part four, I think it was, uh, you know, the FIPG is the form in place gasket. So, not familiar with all the different acronyms from all the different manufacturers, but FIPG is short for silicone. So, or form in place gasket. Um, I guess that's it. Yeah, so the cover's on, it's bolted down, uh, it's torqued on. Um, I guess the next step is going to be to install the uh, tensioner, and I haven't gotten to the part on the uh, video where it, you know, it tells you how to release the lock tab, but Thankfully, one of my viewers says that once you put it in, rotate the engine backwards, and uh, that will, you know, obviously put tension on the non-tension side of the engine, if you will. Um, and then what happens is, so this is the little lock tab right here that's actually holding the tensioner. And so when we when we work it backwards, essentially what's going to happen is it's going to flick that open, you know, releasing the little lock uh, hook. So, and then that'll allow the tensioner to come out. Um, so yeah, so somebody mentioned that, so I don't even have to look it up, which is handy. And then the other thing, it has a gasket that goes on it. And you would have thought that it would have came in the timing cover set by Felpro, but it doesn't. The timing cover set, oddly enough, only comes with the, uh, the front crank seal and a couple oil pump gaskets. You know, I, why they don't send that, I don't know. Um, so what I had to do is I just took that gasket. I sprayed it down with some high tech. I'm gonna reuse it um, It's just a tin, you know, just a straight tin gasket No big deal. I've already got it sprayed down right now. So it's ready to go um, And if for some reason it did leak or does leak, you know, which I doubt that it will uh, We could always uh, replace this at a later date. So I'm not too worried about it. If you're not worried about it I'm not worried about it. Are you worried about it? So I'm gonna stick this on there. And instead of uh, rotating the engine backwards, what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna put this on, I'm gonna tighten it down. And with the valve cover off, I can see the tensioning chain guide. I'll probably just reach in there with a screwdriver and just give it a flick and let this release and do what timing chain tensioners do. And uh, then what we can do is rotate the engine over by hand, make sure the pistons don't uh, assist the valves back down, which they shouldn't. Um, the timing the timing is on and I have a personal guarantee from a couple of viewers that it is correct so um, yeah let's get started the tensioner here goes on the back side of the back side of the timing cover um, there's a couple bolts that hold there's a couple studs back there and a couple bolts that hold it on I say bolt. I'm always mixing up nuts and bolts. You think I know at this point, but yeah, just a couple nuts that hold it on rather. Right Over here on the uh, passenger side, or I guess what would be the front of the engine, the timing chain side, we can look down inside. Hopefully, we can see this. So we'll see that. Uh, let's see if I can focus on this for you. That little gray pin that's sticking up in the back, that is the pivot of that hook that was on top of that uh, chain tensioner. So 
um, kind of give you an idea. So I'm going to go down, right down in there, like I said, with just a long screwdriver, and just going to flick backwards on that shoe. It's kind of hard to see it with this lighting, but uh, essentially we'll just re release that hook and, and put tension on our chain. There it goes. I don't know if you heard it or not in the video there, but uh, we can see a little bit of protrusion. I guess if you can kind of decipher what you're looking at, like I say, that gray pin is the top of the hook, and you can see the piston there of the chain tensioner has poked out a little bit. So that's exactly what we wanted it to do. And I guess, you know, rolling the engine backwards would also, uh, you know, have accomplished the same task. So put the crank bolt back in. Just gonna spin it over at least one revolution here. Make sure it doesn't hit the valves, which if it does, we got big, big problems, but you should be in good shape. Should have left the spark plugs out. Before I started rolling it over there, obviously we still had our marks up here on the cams. And down on the crank, you don't have a mark anymore though, because you know your mark was on that orange link and on that lower um, sprocket. So we knew the timing was on when we put the cover on. Well, hopefully it did. So once the cover's on, all you can see is you know the end of the crank and the seal. So I just took and marked a dot on the keyway, marked a dot on the seal. You know, we rotated it around here, you know, a few more times off camera. And, Come up here, double check our cam marks. They're right on the money. Mark on our cranks right back where it was. Um, because once you roll it over, you know, you can't rely on those gold marks and the orange mark anymore until you, I don't know how many times you'd have to roll it over in order for them to be realigned. But, um, you know, so if you're kind of, you know, wondering, you know, did it stay, did something move? Well, just make yourself a few marks. And they, you know, the marks are really kind of redundant. You can, essentially put them anywhere so that is easy for you to reference because essentially it should come back to, you know, any given point, uh, you know, wherever you make your marks. So, uh, you know, if you're just kind of double checking, you know, to make sure things stayed. So there's a little bit of slack in between, in between these cams. I assume that'll be there until we get oil pressure and it, you know, fully holds tension over uh, on the tensioner. Um, but other than that, I think we're ready to kind of keep, uh, keep moving forward here and, getting this thing back together and hopefully fired up before we go home. So we've got the VVT solenoid here. So this controls the oil flow to the uh, uh, intake cam here. And uh, you know, allows it to give it that variable valve timing. So it goes in the back of the head. I'm just gonna go ahead and reinstall that. On the back side of the head here, you've got that BVT solenoid. That's what I just put in. And down here, see if I can get it. You can see the little cover with the two uh, two nuts on it. That's where the timing chain tensioner went. In case you were wondering about that, that's kind of hard to video it and show putting it on, but uh, gives you an idea as to uh, where that, that that's at. This BVT solenoid. I'm not ready to install the valve cover at this point, but. <laughs> I really don't want to lose something down the engine, so I'm just going to set it on just kind of for protection. It just makes me feel a little safer around myself. I think the next, next best thing to do before we get any further is I'm going to go ahead and put this engine mount back on. This thing was kind of a, kind of a pain, really, because, because of this one bolt here. So it mounts way up underneath the ABS unit, so I had to take it essentially cut the ABS unit loose and you know take the bolts out of that and unplug it and kind of just pry it up out of the way to get to this one bolt. I was really thankful that the brake lines weren't you know completely solid rust because that would really damper <laughs> you know doing that but this is absolutely necessary it absolutely has to come out to get the timing cover off because these these bolts here actually bolt down or this you know this stud and, and a couple bolts that go through it actually go through uh, the timing cover so there, there's no way around this but uh, so that's what I'm going to put on next.
threw a jack stand underneath the uh, engine with a little block of wood like I had it propped up before. I want to take and uh, start closing up this gap here a little bit. So keep your eye on that. We'll let the car down. Holler to me when it gets uh, right where we need it. How do we do? Ooh, looks good. So that's what we need is some kind of live interactive repair, maybe with that Google, some Google or other things that uh, Scotty Kilmer and Eric the car guy use with their live questions. We can do live repair interactive. I think, I think I'm onto something. It's Google Hangouts. I knew I'd think of it. I hate it when I draw a blank. So I'm going to take it. I get this bolted on the rest of the way, there's no sense in it. You watch me bolt the motor mount on, it's just, you know, three bolts that hold it on. You gotta, like I say, you gotta kind of wedge up the ABS. And, oh, there's a few bolts that hold the ABS unit on, but if you're doing this job or done this job, you already know that. Quite frankly, I'm pretty intimidated. I'm, always, I'm under the gun with you guys. There's multiple viewers that have announced that they work for Toyota, so I all of a sudden feel grossly inadequate to do this job. But it's uh, always fun having you along, and, and uh, definitely it's helpful when I, you know, when I need help and can ask for it and know that there's a couple pros out there watching and uh, are willing to respond, so stick around. Next thing I think we ought to do, got that, uh, you know, motor mount on, and that goes okay. Like I said, it's just kind of a pain working around those brake lines and stuff, but it's other than that, I mean, it's a pretty straightforward job. So next thing we're gonna do is put the oil pan on. Uh, I just wanna get that on and get that covered up. That way we can put uh, put the exhaust manifold on. And I think that this has to go on first because the exhaust pipe runs underneath there. At least, at least it makes this job easier. I really don't know because it's been so long. <laughs> but I think this logically looks like the next best thing to do. And, I found all the bolts for it in my little cup labeled oil pan, so I can only assume that they go with the oil pan. And it was originally held on with, you know, the gray, ultra gray, ultra gray or the form in place gasket that Toyota uses. I bought a, when I bought the headset, uh, you know, it said that you have to buy it with the time and cover set and time and cover set says you gotta buy it with the oil pan set. So I've got an oil pan set here. I don't know what's included in it. I'm gonna feel kind of silly if I open it up and it's a big tube of gray silicone because <laughs> we could have finished the time and cover job yesterday. Let me grab that and we'll see what's in it. Here's the set I got from Felpro. On the contents, it says it comes with oil pan gasket and RTV black tube. I don't know. I don't know if I should just silicone it back on there or use this gasket. Like I say, from the factory, it had the uh, warm in place stuff on there. Oh, I got, forgot, before I forget to mention, I got my first, well, kind of like the first official hater. YouTube's all new to me, so I'm yet to get my, uh, my official haters and trolls and such as they call them. Here's the gasket. It comes with three tubes of RTV. Wow. Uh, I don't know. You know what? I say we uh, put ultra gray on it. Put it on. I don't know. Let me look underneath. If it's good and flat, here's the pan. Oh gosh, I don't know. I know you guys are like home screaming right now. Use the silicone. Ah oh, gosh, I don't know what to do. Like I say, factory it doesn't have this. The, ga the, the gasket's pretty thick. Appears to be pretty good quality. I tell you what, I'm gonna look underneath. If it's if it's good and flat, which I think it is, I think it's a big machine surface. We'll spray this down with some high tech and uh, go ahead and use this. Um, they probably give you the silicone where the time and cover and the block meet. It always has that little gap. Uh, well, not really a gap, but that little slot. You know what I'm saying? Usually put a dab of silicone on it. I'll look. I'll see. We'll use our judgment. But anyhow, I'm up. Uh, back to my hater on my Toyota. I don't know. I did some video a long time ago when I was first getting started. Toyota Camry. Um, what do I want to say? A, a transmission oil change. 
so it's just you know spill and fill you drain it you put the filter on you fill it up and you move on with your life this guy lost his mind he called me everything but white and <laughs> like he flipped out you should go over there to the video and look at it i mean flipped out so he's pretty upset with me and basically uh like i don't know if he's a subscriber or not but i think i don't think it was a video that really tipped him off he just like i don't know flipped out must have been having a bad day or something because i don't think watching a guy train transmission fluid and if you disagree with this procedure if it makes you that mad wow all right enough about that just wanted to share with you first hater well, I looked underneath, it's flat. I decided we're going with the gasket, just to see. Plus, I don't, I don't think it'll cause any harm. So I'm spraying it down with some high tech. Uh, Permatex makes it. I've used it in a ton of my other videos. Anytime I do a, you know, I guess what I would consider to be a paper gasket, I'm sure there's a technical term for them. Uh, I, it's my habit to use this stuff, and it's also my habit to only sprayed on one side and by that i mean i'm only going to spray it on the side that's going to adhere to the pan because quite frankly once you spray a gasket with this stuff and you know you let it let it tack up and you stick it on the stuff sticks and it sticks really well and it's a whole lot easier in the event we had to remove the pan again it's a lot easier to clean it off this pan than it is clean off that engine block so i use it more as an aid to hold the gasket in place as opposed to an aid in helping it seal. I don't know if it really helps it seal. It is called a sealant, so I'm probably way off, assuming that it doesn't actually help seal. Uh, I kind of depend upon the gasket for that. So the other thing I'm thinking, I'm, in my videos, I'm gonna do a, how many gloves does this job take part? Because it seems like I go through a bazillion of these things. Always ripping and tearing and just falling apart like that. And you just breathe on them. But, I know you guys commented in uh, one of my other videos that about my gloves and that I actually have the sucky kind and need to get some different ones. So I'm going to look into that, but I've got to use up what I have first. And unfortunately, I bought like a case of them, so I'll be griping about them for a while. So these are the spots I was talking about where the timing cover and the oil pan come together. You got the little little slit. It's always a potential for an oil leak. You can see our gray foreman plate gasket oozing out of the crab crack there. And uh, you know, got another one here. So I can only assume the silicone that they send with it. I don't know why there's three tubes in there. Maybe they know their gasket sucks and they want you to <laughs> smear it all up with silicone. But you can see this is a good flat machine surface. I'm not too worried about it. I think the uh, gasket will work just fine. I am gonna put a little dab of gray silicone right there and a little dab right there. And uh, I think we'll be in good shape. I still can't believe I ran out of silicone. Well, there's a whole bunch more bolts to put in it. I'm not gonna bore you with all that, but go put all the bolts in there and we'll get her snugged up to factory specs, whatever that is, I'll have to look it up. So when you guys are working on cars, you ever get that sick feeling like you're forgetting something? I can't help but shake that. Maybe because this thing has just been dragging out so long. I just feel like as you're putting the oil pan on, you're like, don't do it, don't do it little voice in your head. <laughs> yeah, it'll be alright. Oil pan's tight, oil filter's on. Snugged up the drain plug. Looks good. Why do you think we got three tubes? I thought maybe it was a mistake, but I just looked on the back of the box. 
It's supposed to come with three tubes. It's just to reinforce that feeling of not doing something right. I don't see any reason why we can't put the manifold converter back on. Got the ports all cleaned up. Now it comes with a new gasket that goes down here at the bottom. It's got the old one on it and it looks in really good shape. And I'll probably spend more time screwing around, getting the old one off, you know, trying to make the new one fit, assuming it does fit. I've had bad luck with aftermarket, I don't know, I call them exhaust donuts or those, you know, these concaved ones where they've got to fit together with the, you know, male and female half to allow it to, to swivel. So if the factory one is in perfect shape, which this one is, I'm just going to leave it. I am going to put a little bit of never sees on the on the studs sticking out of the head. Now in a previous video I commented on the fact that the guy who makes the can and obviously the people who make the lid and the brush work in two different factories and never communicate as one of my viewers put it because when this comes new you know the cans like this tall and the brush is like this long and they never hit the bottom so I have to give credit where credit is due. Steve Robb he always comments on the videos there and he's from the way up north in Canada because I said that I always buy the little acid brushes at Napa to take place of these so he says he just takes this brush chops it off inserts one of these brushes into it and then recrimps it on there so I have to give credit where credit is due and that's for you Steve so if you guys do that and it doesn't work I didn't come up with it let's get busy he made me promise if I used that that I had to give him credit. So the next time I get a new can of Never Seize, which this stuff lasts like 47 years, unless you're just an animal with it, but you usually don't need much. I don't, I don't know how you ever get to this point. Probably from spilling it or something. I don't know. The other thing I'm going to Never Seize is these are the two bolts that go into the bottom of it, the spring bolt kit. These are the factory ones. Just going to reuse those. No reason not to. The other thing about never sees, I swear, if you get one drop of this on your skin, by the time you get home, this stuff will be up your arm, in your armpits, on your door handle, your truck, be smeared on the side of your face while you're talking to a customer. Stuff's brutal. There's a couple of bolts here that go down on the bottom of that uh, manifold and bottom of that converter that actually bolt into the block. I'm just going to go ahead and locate those, get them in there, just leave them loose, then tighten down the manifold, then go back through and tighten these down.
well, based on what I see, I think the next best thing to do is the water pump. I did get a new water pump. I did spray down the gasket as it is my habit to do. So I say we go ahead and stick this up in there. The old water pump was leaking. It was one of the things that contributed to the antifreeze consumption on this graph. But you know, the main consumption was coming from the back of the head, obviously. But this is one of the pieces that we had to change because the old pump was you know, definitely leaking. So got the bolts right here. I left them in a little plastic thing and labeled them water pump. So I got to believe that they're the water pump bolts. Sometimes I leave, well, not sometimes, often I leave myself little notes, you know, especially when it comes, you know, long term projects or something that sits tore apart for a while. Or even if I don't anticipate it sitting apart for a while, I guess it's always a good habit to, you know, just kind of label your parts because you never know what's going to happen. Particularly in this business, you know, work by myself, you know, I get, I'll tear it apart, I'll walk away, I'll come back, and you'll think, oh, I'll remember that. Well, my memory's about that long, and frankly, I forget. So I find if I leave myself little notes, label things, put things in bags, cups, you know, uh, that's one of my one of my habits. As I, I don't know, probably a lot of you guys have been around for, well, since since I started, you know, just a few months ago, and, and I commented in one of my videos, you know, somebody was like, how do you keep track of all your bolts? Well, I put them in little cups. Um, well, here, let me show you. Just open up the door on this thing. So I put, put seat covers on it, and I got parts sitting in here, but I'll save little, little plastic cups like this one here I labeled driver side wire loom plastic bracket now I don't know what it means but it takes those two bolts and I assume when we get there I'll figure it out this here I got labeled ground wires and loom on passenger valve cover so you know it's little things like that I write it down that way I don't have to remember it and then you just stick it like in these little cups and I suppose you know it would always pay dividends to get like a you know a big thing of like red solo cups or just anything that's cheap, like at the dollar store, if you're doing something like this, take it with a Sharpie. And these things have been written on a bunch of times because there's old marks that have been crossed off and scribbled over. And, and so they're definitely reusable. It's not a waste. So something to think about. I've got all different kinds, like labeled M intake, valve cover. These are just, this is just stuff that I run across in the shop, you know, these little plastic things. So I know, enough of that. So there's where the water pump goes, right up in that uh, open hole there. I'm not going to record putting it in. It's uh, tricky enough to kind of stick your hand up in there and get the bolts and stuff started. So you wouldn't really be able to see anything anyways, but I'll take a little picture of it when I'm done. Toyota guys out there saw that I did not put that wiring harness on the water pump but just so you know I did go back and put it on so there is a wiring harness that runs across there's that one plastic clip that locks into the water pump a couple uh, bolts there on the pump that hold the bracket and then comes up to uh, this connector here that holds to the timing cover so didn't forget it I did on the first go around but uh, I seen it before I had the bolts tight so no big deal might be our best bet now to go ahead and put the alternator in. Set it over on the bench with the bolts that go with it. So we'll get these unscrewed and it sits right there above the water pump. And get that fed through there. Keep on truck. One thing I like to do on alternators is you have this, I don't even know what to call it. It's a little bushing that goes into alternator. It's on most, most alternators and it uh, makes up the gap difference here for the bracket this goes over you put it over a bracket when you tighten it down it draws this bushing in to make up the space so usually to get these alternators off you got to wiggle them you know kind of wiggle them off well it's a whole lot easier to put them on if you don't have to wiggle it back on to line up the hole so with this one here I'm going to stick the bolt back in it I'm going to tap on it with a hammer now I'm not going to tap on it like an animal because essentially I mean if you rail on this thing you could bust this ear off I'm gonna give her a little, a little tap, a little light tap. If that doesn't appear wants to move, we're gonna back this up with like a socket or something and then whale on it. So you can kind of see, hopefully that's focusing, you can see that, you know, distance. 
this little thing right here, this bushing is up out of that ear. So I like to just knock it down until it's you know flush with that ear, just a, just a smidge anyway. So let's see what happens. If you don't want to break something, hit it with a brass hammer. It gives you that little warm feeling like, oh, just hit it with a brass hammer, it won't break. See, brass hammer. You, you could hit a windshield with this, perfectly safe. Hit your finger with it, well, that still hurts. But you can see now, I had to just tap that down just a little bit. You can see the fresh meat coming out of there. So that's a, that'll make it a little more helpful. Like I say, use your mind, not your muscle when you're smashing on it. And use a brass hammer, of course, because that'll definitely prevent it from breaking. And if you're really worried about it, get the plastic dead blow. You can't break anything with one of those. And for the extremely, extremely delicate procedures, you could always use an all wooden hammer. Oh, if only it were all true. I'll be so glad when summer is here we don't have to listen to that stupid furnace anymore. I gotta get out and get that new blower motor for that thing. Alrighty, gotta get up there and give it a whack with a screwdriver to get it running sometimes. Like I said, I put a new one on it a month ago or whatever it was. The new one was junk right out of the box. I gotta get up there and get it before the guy doesn't want to warranty it anymore. He was hesitant to warranty it when it was new. He's like, well, you know, you shouldn't have put it on. Well, how am I supposed to know it's bad unless I put it on? You're the furnace guy, you should have been able to tell that. <laughs> I don't know. I'm still griping about it, I should just go fix it. That's what I should do. Okay, let's get some, uh, let's get some wrenches. So I made the comment about the gloves, like, you know, how many gloves we're gonna go through. I put these on, they're like indestructible. I get like the best pair out of the entire box gonna finish the whole job with them. So that last little bit there where it was acted like it got hard, I was pulling that bushing back through to make up that space. Yes, I put the cover back on. I'm really just kind of putting off putting the intake manifold on because I don't know if you guys were here in the beginning. Well, I don't want I don't know how many people watched the original diagnosis video, but pulling that intake off, that kind of sucked. And being that it's on this lift over here. But I took the intake off on the other lift. Oh, geez, I can't find the hole. Um, there it is. I took the intake off on the other lift, and uh, you know it's a whole lot easier to work on that. This this lift's really invasive. You know, it doesn't give you much room to get underneath it. And if I remember right, that intake had like some bolts on the backside that were real stinker to get to. So. But once I had the intake off, me and Vanessa just pushed the thing outside. We pushed it over here because I knew it was. I didn't want to tie up a you know a good lift or a bigger lift, I guess. So that's kind of oh yeah. And that's the other reason I'm not putting the valve cover on quite yet because I think if I remember right, when I took that intake off, I think if I had pulled the valve cover, it might have given us some more room. I I can't really recall. I'm just making stuff up right now. But no, I think, I think that having the valve cover off might give us that little extra room. I can't remember. It was binding up on something and it was really kind of a pain. We'll see. Maybe it'll just slip right in there. I'm gonna get this water pump fully tightened up. And then possibly the power steering next. I'm gonna look at directions and see what they suggest. One more pair gone. According to what I read, I probably should have put the intake manifold on a while ago. 
but I think it's really redundant because there's nothing that we put on currently that's going to help us or hinder us, rather, uh, from putting the intake on. It's just the order in which they do things. Um, so, yeah, I guess we'll keep going. I'm going to put the uh, uh, power steering pump on because, like I said, it's not, I don't think it's going to benefit us from leaving it off and, uh, you know, put that on, put the crank pulley on. The intake just basically, you know, bolts to the back of the head, but there's a couple bolts underneath it, uh, a couple bolts on the, on the bottom of the intake. Uh, that if I remember, I think they suck to get to. If I remember, I don't know, it's been a while, it's been too long. So, but I remember having a hard time getting the intake actually out of, you know, up and like over the head. And I want to say, ah, oh, I should have pulled the valve cover, but for whatever reason, I didn't. The only other thing, there's that big diaper looking unit that goes behind, excuse me, goes behind the manifold to the block. Now, I have done some reading online, and they're saying, or, you know, and I don't know, maybe you guys know because you work, some of you work for Toyota, that that is the root cause or supposedly one of the causes of these bolts pulling out, you know, overheating that area of the block causing the bolts to fail. I don't know if that's true, but I do remember that diaper was, that thing was a pain to get up out of there. And I don't see its purpose. And I'm not gonna, I'm honestly, I'm just gonna leave it out. It's like completely saturated with coolant. I don't see its purpose other than maybe a noise barrier. I don't know, I hope I'm not making a critical mistake. I mean, it's not one that's irreversible. I mean, you could always go back and reinsert it if all of a sudden it's things like, you can just hear the air rushing through and it's, <laughs> you know, unbearable, but I doubt it. And besides, I mean, that's what made this whole job a pain, kind of, because I couldn't see the initial leak with that big sponge in there because it was just absorbing all the coolant. And, you know, you couldn't see, so we had to pull the intake to take the diaper out to see, you know, where's this leak generating? I'm gonna leave it out, right or wrong, please don't judge me on that. Um, you know, I do read a lot of guys online that are, that are leaving them out and, you know, because they, they think it's the root cause of the problem. So I'm going with that theory. Before we get started in all that mess though, I'm gonna enjoy me a little cup of joe and a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, minus the jelly, because we're all out of jelly in the office. Don't have to have a little chat with us about that one. Well, we do have some jelly, but it's, it's some homemade stuff she made. It's really not that good. Don't tell her I said that. <laughs> well, I told her. I mean, it was some, it was like the sugarless stuff she made one time. Give me the jelly with the 800 pounds of sugar in it any day of the week. I mean, it's okay. It's edible, but it's a little tart. We'll just leave it at that. Tart. I don't know if any of your guys' wives make you jelly or not, or your moms or grandmas or whatever, but my mom makes this strawberry jelly. I think they call it freezer jam. That stuff's got so much sugar in it, it's almost gritty. Now that's good stuff. Tea time's over, so we're gonna take the pump and uh, stick it up here on the side of the engine block, or on the front of the engine block, rather, and, and the bolts that are in the power steering pump are gonna slide over those notches. And then there's a couple of ears off the back of the block that they actually thread into, so that's what I'll be doing down here. Pump is up and in and on, and it's a little tricky just because of the clearance between the, the frame and, and the pulley, it's hard to find the right size socket combination to get in there. So at any rate, next thing we're gonna do is the tensioner here, a little tensioner shock absorber spring unit, we'll call it. And essentially, if I remember correctly, this uh, is going to go up here just above the pump. Probably should have done it before I put the pump on but I didn't, and it has this long bolt that goes through uh, through the block, and it's a nut and a bolt, so I have to reach it from the back side, and then the little uh, little shock assembly or spring assembly here goes on the bottom, and it goes off from this stud uh, that we, we uh, took off there when we did the time and cover. And of course I lied to you again. The bolt that goes through that tensioner is not a nut and a bolt. I simply put the nut on the back side of it, which this is the nut that actually goes on the stud that 
holds the spring. So I tricked myself. I put it there so I wouldn't lose it. I went to wiggle that bolt through that, you know, the top one there. And I, oh, it's got threads in it. So Toyota guys are there just like shaking their head. Tension assembly went pretty well. Once we figured out it was a threaded hole. <laughs> I sprayed a little fluid film on the lip of our seal. And I've got the, uh, I went over and just took the uh, crank pulley here uh, on the wire brush and got rid of the old carbon and oil gunk that was built up on that. So, uh, you know, make sure there's not a groove in it. There's a really, really light groove. I don't think it's gonna hinder us from sealing. I'm gonna put a little, uh, little fluid film on that. It's kind of help guide it in that seal. Think the belt's on there all the way. You might be asking yourself, how many ways can that belt go on? Well, 47. About 47 different ways, I figure. I think we're at a good point to attempt to put the intake manifold back on. I'm gonna pull the belt valve cover back off, see if that gives us a little more room. I've taken the two studs back out of the head that were um, for the fuel injector rail. So I took them back out to, you know, buy us a little room to go back over. And the other thing I did is I come back in here and I reattached uh, this wire loom. There is a bolt. I can't see anything on the camera right now, but there's a bolt down, uh, right down in this area here that holds that wire loom on. There's another one on the side of the head. And the other thing uh, that's over here, uh, there's a ground wire over here somewhere. Let's just do this by feel. You guys can see better than I can. So there's a ground wire. There's a bolt that holds this bracket on. So I took and uh, just put those back on uh, because they go up underneath the intake. And some of the problem is, like I said, on this lift, especially being all-wheel drive, it's difficult to get to anything back here. And if I remember right, that intake was tight, like real tight against the firewall. This wiring harness with these clips on it, uh, this has to reattach to the back of the intake you know once we put it uh, put it down through there and then the intake manifold you know, obviously just go you know sits here on the head and uh, you know hooks over those studs I don't remember you know the studs hindering us at all I just remember it being tight and a real pain here it is I just put the uh, just got one of them rubber gaskets there that just kind of sit right in there goes right in the groove these are the two bolts that are bolted on from the back side. You know, once it's up underneath, it's real difficult to get to, like I say, if I remember right. The one I think is easy. One of them, one of them stinks. Um, I've got the throttle body that bolts on here. I've got that gasket off. Uh, I think we've got a, probably a brake booster, uh, brake booster hose hooks here. So we've got another one here, a PCV or something. Um, we'll figure it out once we get it in, but See if we can't uh, get that thing slipped over. I think if I remember right, we, we pulled the diaper out. And I don't remember. Took a few things off and I was like, Bruh. it wouldn't come, it was tight. And I think it was the valve cover because I don't remember pulling the valve cover. Maybe I did, I don't know. I just remember it was tight. So, made a mountain out of a molehill, I think. I 
think it would be in, uh, in the best interest to get the valve cover back on before I even start screwing around with that intake. We're this close to having it running. Sure hate to drop something down in there. Oh, that'd just give you a sick feeling, wouldn't it? And that reminds me of a story. I've got lots of stories. I've been pulling wrenches for a little while, so I've experienced a couple things along the way. But I have this one fun memory of a Honda that I was working on, and I was doing the valve adjustment on it, mechanical valves, you know, mechanical rock arms. And I was using this very ratchet, this little snap on quarter inch drive. And, you know, I've got the uh, valve lash all set, and I'm tightening down the, the jam nut on the rocker arm. And all of a sudden I look at my ratchet and I see it's missing the head of one of the screws. And I, and I thought I heard something and it was, it was awful. <laughs> Cause I knew it was gone and I knew I heard it hit inside the head. And I'm really, really fortunate. I just stopped and looked and looked and looked and I finally found it. It was like sitting like right on the edge of one of the oil drains for the head. And uh, dude, I was so I was so happy to be able to find that and see that and get it out of there with a magnet. And like I vowed to never use that ratchet again doing a valve adjustment, but of course I have. But so yeah, so that's one story. That I mean, that that would have went bad. You know, you drop a you know you drop a quarter down in there or something, it hits the bottom of the oil pan. Big deal. It's not going anywhere. If you drop a little head off a screw, you know where that's going to end up. It's going to end up right in the oil pump. So I'm sure you guys probably have some similar experiences of, you know, having engines open and, you know, perhaps dropping something. But hopefully none of them are real bad stories. But you guys have told me some pretty pretty funny stories. I mean, funny in the sense it happened to you and not me. But <laughs> okay, let's get this thing put on. Toyota guys out there. So this is the throttle body gasket. What what's what what is that for? I think in case the thing sucks up a squirrel. I don't know. I see that. I, I don't know. It only I mean it only covers half of it. I I have no idea. I'm not gonna lie. I'm not gonna pretend like I know. I think it's to keep squirrels from going down the intake if it accidentally sucks up a squirrel.
thing I did is I plugged in the ABS there. I was over here working and running the wires and stuff, and I see I left that connector unplugged after I you know, already bolted the unit back down. So don't forget to plug that back in if you have that unplugged. Big ground wire there. I'm gonna find a connector for the VVT solenoid. I don't see that laying out in the open here. Yeah. Okay, so it comes over on this harness. So this is the harness for the injector. It's like sitting right on the end of that. Uh, no big deal. I think. I think everything is is ready to go. Just got to bolt the intake down. Put the throttle body on it. And air cleaner assembly. I did hook up the uh, brake booster hose. That's hooked up. All the coolant lines over here that actually hook to the head. I've got those hooked up. Wiring harness, coils, valve covers tight, um, ground wire here. So yeah, I think I think we're in a, in a pretty good position to go ahead and, and bolt the intake down now. I don't think we're missing anything. We're running out of parts over there pretty quick. That was the only that ground wire bolt was the only you know loose bolt I had left over in my uh, box of head parts. Uh, so yeah, we're doing good. I did. There is on this wiring harness over here. So it bolts right here on the valve cover. There's another one down on the bottom side. Well, I left that one loose so I could, you know, manipulate it around and you know move the valve cover. So I did have to reach back through underneath and get that one. That was a little tough because uh, I'd use a long extension right straight through to get to it, uh, simply because all the hoses and everything are in the way now. But I didn't want to tighten it up initially and then try to move this and have it, you know, have it break. Um, so I think it was a wiser thing to do. Uh, yeah, let's keep rolling. Basically, you can get to all the intake bolts from up top except for one. This is one of the ones that goes through from the back side. That wiring harness I showed you early on uh, with the little brown connectors, you can reach underneath, you can pop that in uh, pretty easily. I'm gonna go underneath, I'm gonna put the one bolt in it uh, that's kind of a stinker to get to. The other one that's kind of tough is this one in the back corner underneath the VVT solenoid. So I'm not gonna record a lot of the manifold. I'm just gonna go ahead and just put it on, tighten it up, get the one bolt underneath. If you wanna see a little more on the intake, Look at the very first video. So I'll put all these videos in a playlist of this RAV4. And the very first one is actually diagnosing the coolant leak and removing the intake manifold. So you can get a good, pretty good concept of you know how the manifold comes off. You know, granted when you're watching it, pull the valve cover because I think that made a world of difference. So that last bolt, you can easily reach through the wheel opening. So not that big a deal. Didn't even really have to get under the lift. I mean, I got under it and I could see it and then I just, you know, went through the wheel opening. So it's actually pretty easy. Oh, I don't want to put that on yet. I want to wait to get the injectors in. So leave that up. Oh, let's see what's next. Oh, we've got this one here. So yeah, I guess we, uh, I guess we got to put the fuel injectors in. I'm going to go get some oil. I'd hate to forget something like that. <laughs> Put the uh, injectors back in. Now it's got these little rubbers. There should be four of them total. Uh, they were in the head. They're still uh, real pliable. I'm gonna go ahead, but they, they don't come new in the headset, unfortunately. The headset comes with some silly non-usable stuff, but I think they could update it and add a, add a few usable things. You know, the, the timing chain tensioner gasket would be one, these being another. So I did save them before I sent the head to the machine shop. And uh, I'm just going to go ahead and put these back in the head. If I can see them. Starting to get nervous. Well, not really. Hit the floor. 
drop something and it doesn't hit the floor. Oh man. So anytime I drop something, I just get real quiet. I try to listen to where it goes. <laughs> You'd be surprised. After you drop enough stuff, you can kind of hear it hit things on the way down and you're like, oh, that's laying on a control arm. All based on sound. I'm gonna hook up the gas line here. Put the little protective cover on it. Keep it from coming undone. All right, injector harness back over here. Fingers to work here. Hook up that VVT solenoid. Goes on the intake. Okay, let me grab the throttle body gasket and the with the squirrel trap in it. Got the new squirrel proof gasket. I'm gonna go ahead and just stick that on there. Grab the throttle body. I was gonna go and throw that on, but she's looking a little nasty. So, probably give her a quick cleaning. She's good and shiny now. You can see she's cleaned up real nice. So that'll be good. At least we won't have any kind of low idle concerns or anything of that nature. And I know you're sitting at home saying, what did you clean that with? Or maybe you're not, but at any rate, my favorite throttle body cleaner when the throttle body is off the car is seafoam. I mean, the stuff essentially dissolves the black gookie crap. So I think they call it throttle body coking. But if you, I just use an old toothbrush, an old nylon brush, and uh, seafoam. You just dump a little in there. You just, I mean, it literally takes 10 seconds. So, and you don't have to worry about it being, you know, throttle body safe. You know, some of the old coated Ford throttle bodies, they were, you know, you couldn't use carb cleaner in them because the coating was gone and then they'd idle really high. And if you learned that the hard way, I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't remember if I did. I don't think so. I think I always remember seeing a little sticker on them. I always wanted to try it, but heard all the horror stories. So yeah, long story short, seafoam. Purge solenoid or something earlier there, we gotta get hooked up. I don't think Toyota calls them purge solenoids, I think they're vapor switching valves or something of that nature. Cool lines are hooked up. I guess that we need the air cleaner because we're running out of things. This must be a mass air, yeah, mass airflow and another vapor switching valve of some sort. We're running out of parts, it's almost go time. All right, went over to my pile. I've got this little unit right here. So I'm thinking that looks good right about there. Oh, I'll find a place to make it fit. Then I've got this here. Very good pair of pliers. Yeah, here's, we we'll use these. All oh, these clamps are finger snappers, let me tell you. You've done any amount of car work, you've been snapped by a pair of them things. Let's see, I gotta put that on there exactly how it was. Otherwise, I'll be up all night. I was you 
guys, I'd start placing your bets on whether or not it's going to run. Get all that finalized. Too long. I think the last few parts are down. So we got here, so that's the clean side. So we'll put this air filter in. That's it's my habit to do. As I think, once we get this in, we'll get this bolted down. And what I'd like to do is. Uh, start it up just briefly before we put any coolant in it to make sure it runs because uh, if there's a major problem or something it's a whole lot easier to not have to mess around with coolant again I guess if that makes sense I think there's one other part left yep there it is goes down on the throttle body. Crap. It appears to go down here. Yeah, I guess I have to take that off all the way. question to myself is why didn't I just stick this on the throttle body to begin with? So yeah, it goes there and it clips onto this hose right here. It's the only other hose that has a little mark on it, so that's where it's got to go. about won the war there. I had to put that, I'm trying to get that tube back on the throttle. I should have just pulled the whole stinking mess back. It shredded me. Well, the only part we have left out of our parts pile is the diaper. No extra bolts, a couple extra gaskets, but they don't really pertain to the job that we did. Uh, I guess that's it. It's go time. Might better hook up the battery. And Get all this crap out of the way. Hit the button. Like I say, before we put any coolant in it, I want to hear it run. So, let's see. I 
I cycle on the key a couple of times, let it build some fuel pressure. I sign. Um, I don't want to leave it run that long. I don't have any antifreeze in it. So let me grab the old radiator bucket. It's almost 930 at night. Um, yeah, might better let it warm up. Make sure. I uh, see the no check engine light or anything just in that brief, you know, couple seconds. So grab some antifreeze. I'm going to throw the smart funnel on there and get this baby filled up. Went upstairs into my inventory where I keep all the antifreeze and stuff. <laughs> I, I like to use this uh, Asian spec and the Toyotas here. Walk upstairs, I didn't see any. I'm like, oh, man, you gotta be kidding me. Whew. Fortunately, I just had it on the wrong shelf. You always wanna hear it burping like that because if it just dumps straight in, you got a leak somewhere. Bad idea to check the oil. I did dump four quarts in it. Yeah, it's right between the high and the low, so or the what they call it, yeah, low and the full, so that would be good good enough for right now. It's all done burping. It's got a little cool in there, so let's go ahead and start it up. Look down the oil cap, and there's oil slinging off the can, so that's always a good sign. That's pretty quiet. Since keeping the camera on while it warms up, I'll let it sit here and warm up. I'm gonna get a little bit of smoke off from it from the oil and stuff on the exhaust, but I think it turned out pretty good. I don't know how many of you guys were betting it wasn't gonna run, but all right, let's see in a second. I'm happy to see after about oh, 20 minutes of running here, so it warmed up, thermostat open, it got good heat on the inside, water pump's good and dry. Don't see anything dribbling out of the crank pulley or down the side of the timing cover, so that's always a plus. Oil pan looks good, filtered, everything else. So we had a part there. I feel pretty good about it. Oil pan gasket appeared to work. It's still interesting why they sent it with three tubes of silicone. Well, really all we got left down here is uh, putting this fender liner in, putting the tire back on, take it for a little shimmy down the road. It's almost 10 o'clock at night. I'm ready to call it quits. Uh, it's been a long day. I've got it all put back together. It runs. 
Uh, I just want to be done with it. I haven't heard the head bolts come up, hit the bottom of the valve cover yet, so that's a plus. So I guess we'll leave it at that, viewers. Thanks for watching. Thanks for sticking with me through this. These long jobs take a lot out of me to record, so <laughs> we uh, appreciate all the thumbs up, the likes on Facebook, all the subscriptions. We're getting subscribers like crazy. So that's pretty cool. Definitely, it's been a lot of fun with the YouTube, and we really appreciate the donations. I, I thoroughly appreciate that. It helps kind of keep me rolling and keep me motivated. And uh, I guess, well, just thanks for watching. And uh, remember, viewers, if I can do it, you can do it.